what I want to try and, and do is to think about or look at this notion of politics of translation uh, in terms of some of the, what seems to me, uh, the major challenges that we're facing in this century and, and beyond. Um, and I want to begin, if you like, tonight's lecture um, with a uh, special sort of anniversary issue of the New York uh, Review of Books. Um, so this is 2013, so the 50th uh, anniversary uh, of uh, the first uh, issue of one of uh, America's kind of leading uh, cultural uh, periodicals. Um, and in this uh, issue, um, they asked uh, this man here, uh, Timothy Garton Ash, the British uh, historian, probably best known for his work on uh, Central and uh, Eastern uh, Europe. Um, they asked uh, Ash uh, to write uh, an essay, a 6,000 word essay, on what he thought were the major changes globally uh, since the first issue of the New York Review of Books hit the newsstands in 1963. So he's asked to kind of look, if you like, at that half century, and what did he think were the important things that had happened? Um, so he talked about um, the, uh, the rise and staggered fall of the US as a hyperpower. Um, he talked about the growing importance and confidence of China. He talked about the importance uh, of the uh, Arab world. He talked about uh, how human rights have become a central preoccupation of politics in many uh, jurisdictions. Uh, he talked uh, about the uh, exploding world of digital uh, opportunity. But in the 6,115 words, there wasn't a single word about rising sea levels. There wasn't a single word uh, about what was happening uh, to the uh, glaciers. Uh, there wasn't a single word about uh, species uh, extinction. Uh, in other words, um, although from uh, 1990 onwards, the Intergovernmental uh, Plan um, Panel on Climate Change had pointed to incontrovertible evidence uh, for the single biggest uh, change uh, in uh, human sort of culture and, and society, there isn't a single word about this in the Timothy Carton uh, Ash uh, essay. Um, if we sort of uh, fast forward um, to uh, our own year here, uh, 2017, um, the US uh, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration um, has just published its annual report in the bulletin of the American Meteorological uh, Society. Um, they said that the year 2016 uh, showed uh, extreme cause for uh, concern. Um, at any given time in that year, one-eighth of the world's uh, landmass was suffering from severe uh, drought. Um, and this is far higher than uh, normal. Uh, there was extreme weather everywhere uh, on the uh, planet. Uh, a heat wave uh, in many parts of the globe, especially India, and those gigantic uh, wildfires in Canada. Uh, the global sea level rose by uh, 3.4 millimetres for the sixth uh, straight uh, year in a row. Um, there were 93 tropical uh, cyclones across the globe, 13% more than uh, normal. And the world's glaciers shrank uh, for the 37th uh, year in uh, a row. Um, so basically, what the, um, this bulletin is, um, the kind of evidence that the bulletin is producing, um, is that the kind of climate change that uh, has been reported on, was reported on very explicitly from 1990 onwards, that is silenced in Timothy Garton's uh, kind of conspectus of change in world uh, politics, uh, is uh, very much with, with us uh, and it's growing more intense. What I want to do uh, in this um, lecture this evening is to try and uh, sketch out uh, briefly uh, a number of concepts related to this that may be familiar to some of you and the audience less familiar to, to, to others. Um, and then the bulk of my lecture is I'm going to try and think through what might be uh, the implications for how we think about translation and the, uh, and the practice uh, of translation uh, in uh, the century uh, ahead of us. Um, the first um, or most explicit, most popular, uh, if you like, expression um, of what the implications of, of climate change are um, is the notion of the, the, uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, which was 
first formulated um, by uh, two scientists in 2002 in Nature uh, magazine, um, where um, Kurzfeld and Stormer um, argued um, that the cumulative effect of human uh, activities uh, was uh, leading to a new uh, geological uh, era. Uh, in other words, if we had um, different geological eras in the, uh, in the past, most recently uh, that of the Holocene, which leads to the end of the Ice Age, the emergence of agriculture, second civilizations, and so on, uh, the cumulative uh, effect of greenhouse gas emissions from the kind of the, the 1750s uh, onwards, kind of debate about when this uh, actually began, and so on, uh, is one that the, the is has such uh, uh, an extraordinary effect um, that it's moving us uh, into a new uh, geological era uh, where the effects of human activities uh, will be equivalent to uh, the movement of the shifting of tectonic plates, uh, the eruption of uh, volcanoes, uh, and uh, and so on. Um, the um, Indian uh, theorist uh, Dipesh uh, Chakrabarti uh, argues um, that one of the consequences uh, of the, the Anthropocene is that we have to rethink um, our notion of what constitutes history. Uh, in other words, that whereas before there was a kind of notion um, that you had uh, geological history which uh, operated on extraordinarily extended uh, timescales, uh, and human history that act on a very, very contracted uh, time scale. Um, so it was of little consequence in the long uh, time of, of geology. One of the effects of the notion of the Anthropocene is that you begin to get a kind of convergence between geological history and uh, human history. In other words, um, that you have to, to think about the humans not just as, if you like, uh, biological agents who interact with the environment, who always are part of this kind of environmental setup. Um, but you have to think about them now, not as biological agents, which they've, they've always been, but now as geological uh, agents. Um, but the thing about uh, humans as geological uh, agents um, is not, if you like, a kind of uh, further vindication uh, of uh, human dominance, kind of human supremacy. We've now been elevated, if you like, from the status of biological to geological agent, uh, but rather what it demonstrates is extreme human vulnerability. Um, that the kind of those externalities uh, of the, uh, the environment, um, which were kind of uh, taken for granted, were not valued, were seen as part of the, uh, of the commons, um, they are now, if you like, uh, coming back to bite us and, and bite us uh, hard. Um, so that one of the things about this kind of convergence of human history and geological history is you have to think about uh, humans in relation to other species and in relation to the, uh, the non-human. But this becomes, if you like, a central part of trying to think about what it means uh, to be human in the 21st uh, century. Um, the, another way of uh, thinking about or, or formulating this is the uh, French and a philosopher, Michel Serre, who talks about what he calls the great story, the, the, the grand récit. And what he means by this is that you have like four stages in, in this story. You have a uh, Big Bang, so the, the, the emergence uh, of our, our universe. Uh, then you have uh, the cooling, the expansion, uh, the appearance of uh, material and bodies. And the third stage is the replication of uh, RNA, and you can get the emergence of uh, multicellular uh, organisms. Uh, and then the fourth stage is uh, that of the emergence of uh, Homo uh, sapiens, or uh, humanoids in, in, in various uh, forms. Now, the important thing about this is that Sir um, talks about this conversation not in a kind of teleological fashion, you know, where, where the ultimate if you like, expression of this development, of this story, the kind of the end point is uh, the emergence of humans, but rather that humans are part of this uh, see. They're, they're kind of connected uh, to this uh, larger uh, story. They're embedded in this story in uh, particular ways. Um, the Dutch um, cultural theorist, uh, Rosie Bedotti, um, takes some of these uh, ideas um, to argue for what she calls um, the emergence of the post-human. Now, the problem is the post-human um, 
often kind of there's two different versions of this. Uh, one is a kind of array courts file, the notion of you know, moving towards the singularity, the kind of convergence of the machinic uh, and the human. Um, the other, and this is Bredotti's uh, idea, is that what you see in, in our age, um, in this age of the Anthropocene, in the age of uh, you know, human uh, vulnerability, in the age of humans being embedded in this larger uh, non-human story, uh, is the emergence of what she calls the transversal subject. And what she means by the transversal subject is the way in which humans have to think about their relatedness uh, to uh, other species, uh, the non-human, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, one of the, um, the kind of the elements uh, of that uh, is to contest the notion of human exceptionalism. Right? That human exceptionalism, uh, often coming but not only from the Cartesian moment, Cartesian dualism, where on the one hand you've got kind of uh, machinic or mechanical uh, animals, on the other you've got kind of ensouled, uh, rational uh, human beings who are possessed of language uh, and self-conscious uh, reflexivity, um, and this makes uh, humans uh, not only distinct uh, but superior. And then you get this distinction uh, between reason and uh, emotion, uh, mind, uh, body, and, and, and so on. Um, so what uh, Redotti is arguing for is that in this, what she calls post-human, uh, I tend to prefer the notion of the post-anthropocentric, um, because you know, the things that humans remain, but it's the, it's the form or how we conceptualize and think about uh, our humanity that is, uh, is different. Um, so what she would, would would argue is that we have this uh, transversal uh, subject, uh, we have to rethink uh, when we talk about the humanities, what exactly do we mean about the humanities in a post anthropocentric uh, moment? Um, and then, of course, um, and this is the, the question that uh, Gridotti doesn't uh, ask, but that I'm going to try and ask this evening, is that if we're talking about transversal subjectivity, if we're talking about a notion of relationality between human and non human, Surely we have to think about the notion of the translation. Surely we have to think about how um, this kind of relationality is going to happen, how we're going to establish, if you like, a kind of relationship between things that are not uh, commensurable uh, at various levels uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, I think one of the ways in which um, we might think about this in translation studies um, is that um, arguably there have been um, two dominant paradigms so far in how we think about translation. The first is what I would call the, the nation uh, paradigm. So this is basically what role does translation play in the emergence of uh, national languages, uh, in the emergence of different national identities, uh, in the emergence of uh, nation uh, states, and um, what with the role of translation in the construction, the emergence of the Estonian language? Uh, what was the role of translation uh, in the development of Finnish nationalism in the 19th century, in the emergence uh, of uh, the Czech, uh, state Czech identity in the 19th century? What has been uh, the role of uh, translation uh, in uh, the conceptualization, justification, the defense, uh, the elaboration of uh, Irish uh, identity as it moved away uh, from uh, empire in the late 19th and early uh, 20th uh, century. Um, another uh, paradigm of translation is the globalizing one. And in the globalizing paradigm, you concentrate not so much on the construction of you know, endogenous uh, nation states, languages, cultures, and identities, and so on, but you look at the transnational movement of ideas. Um, look at the, the Enlightenment, look at the Scientific Revolution, look at the Renaissance, um, you look at the spread of communism, you look at the spread of liberalism, uh, and, and so on. And um, you look at the uh, movement of peoples, how peoples uh, move or don't move, are translated or not translated uh, from one part uh, of the world uh, to the uh, other. Um, what happens to food when food moves uh, from when the, uh, the pizza goes to the United States, what happens to it? And then what, what happens then when it gets reimported uh, to the United States? Um, at the last count, I think there are uh, 19 uh, Irish pubs here in Melbourne. Uh, does an Irish pub in Melbourne look like a kind of an Irish pub that you find in Dublin? What happens when it gets translated uh, from one locale uh, to, to another? So that kind of, so if you like, the, the kind of globalizing moment, um, this is a, another kind of paradigm uh, to look at uh, translation. What I want to suggest tonight 
is um, that we need to think about another uh, paradigm, which is not the nation paradigm, which is not the, the globe uh, paradigm, um, but the earth uh, paradigm. What happens, if you like, um, if we bring uh, translation studies uh, down to, to earth? If we think about uh, sort of an earth-centered uh, uh, translation uh, studies. Um, and this is where, if you like, um, I'm going to suggest that um, one of the things we need to think about is to what extent is translation studies, the way we think about and conceptualize translation, uh, been overly anthropocentric? Uh, and what might a terra centric uh, translation studies uh, look like? Um, in this respect, then, I'm going to look at um, sort of four different, and this is not to exhaust the, the, the particular topic. <laughs> <laughs> might feel a bit exhausted at the end of the, uh, the lecture, but it's just four, if you like, you know, potential lines of inquiry under the rubric of a terra-centric translation studies. So the first is what I'm, uh, Elizabeth Pogonelli calls geontology. Uh, the second will be uh, interspecies communication, so talking to, to animals. Uh, the third is what I'm going to call the uh, resource uh, unconscious. Uh, and the fourth are uh, future-oriented cosmologies, uh, particularly uh, the case uh, of uh, indigenous languages and uh, cultures. Um, so let me begin then um, with <coughs> geoontology. <coughs> um, Elizabeth uh, Pavanelli, the US uh, anthropologist, who has done uh, a lot of uh, work with uh, various uh, Aboriginal communities here in, in Australia, uh, one of the things that she uh, noticed as a kind of recurring feature of those cultures is that the kind of distinction between what she calls bio, biography and geography uh, was anything but watertight. In other words, the kind of relationship between uh, humans and uh, the non-human world, between humans' subjectivity and uh, the non-human world uh, was extremely labile, was extremely uh, fluid. Um, and that one of the things that um, she sees as uh, important in terms of the, the Anthropocene, in terms of its kind of relationality that I was talking about a little earlier, is, um, that is to think about, if you like, uh, cultures uh, or ways of thinking um, that don't make that absolutely rigid uh, distinction uh, between uh, human and, and non-human. So in other words, she uh, would argue that, say, for example, Foucauldian notions of biopower uh, tend to place far too much emphasis on the notion of living uh, organisms. And we have to think about uh, relationships to non-living uh, organisms as, as well. And this is why she prefers the notion of geo-ontology, uh, geo uh, onto uh, car and, uh, and, and so on. And one of, if you like, one of the consequences um, of the uh, extractive uh, industries is precisely, if you like, uh, the tendency to disregard, uh, not take seriously, uh, see in, in purely exploitative and instrumental terms uh, the uh, non-human uh, uh, world. Um, so in thinking about the uh, human um, <clears throat> beings in the age of the, the, the Anthropocene, it's thinking about um, how we uh, relate to uh, these uh, other non-human parts uh, of our context or uh, environment. Um, one of the um, people who has written about this notion of um, uh, objects and the object world and non-human and so on uh, is uh, Timothy uh, Morton, who is uh, loosely linked to uh, a school, philosophical school, one of the worst acronyms I can think of, who, which is uh, object-oriented uh, ontology, or sometimes called speculative uh, realism. And basically what Morton uh, argues is that too much of our thinking is subject to what he calls Kantian correlationism. So Kantian correlationism is basically the, the idea um, that you can only have an object if there's a thinking subject. You can only have an object if there's a thinking subject to bring it uh, into, into being. Um, and what Morton is arguing is that one of the features of, of climate change, of the Anthropocene, is that objects are producing or proven to be object. This kind of non-human world that we've exploited, instrumentalized, disregarded, is, is now coming back uh, with unexampled uh, ferocity uh, to threaten the very survival of the species that claims to be uh, the only species capable uh, of uh, making uh, sense uh, of it. Um, 
And he uh, talks about this notion of the hyper-object. And the hyper-object is something that is extended in space and time. Uh, so say, for example, and he sees climate change as, as, as one of these hyper-objects. Uh, it's something that began some time back. It's going to go on for a very, very long time. Uh, when I throw away a styrofoam cup, um, it will take about 400 years to uh, biodegrade. Uh, what would the world look like in 400 years' time? What would Australia look like uh, 400 years ago? Um, if I go to France and I plug in my electric kettle, um, I'm going to be using, in all probability, um, nuclear uh, powered uh, energy. Um, and the uh, attrition rate for plutonium is about 24,000 years. So what's the world going to look like in 24,000 years' uh, time? So uh, basically, Morton is this idea of, uh, of objects kind of extending uh, over much expanded uh, time uh, scales. Where this, it seems to me, uh, comes into the picture for us in thinking about translation is in terms of what we might call the symbolic uh, universe. Um, Rowan Williams, um, who's a thinker and a poet, also the Archbishop of Canterbury at, at, at one stage, um, but in a recent work on, on, on language, um, he makes the, the, the point that you know, what you find in uh, so many dimensions uh, of the non-human world is the capacity to, uh, to store, to process, uh, and to transmit uh, information in various uh, ways. That the idea of matter as something inert, as something mindless, something that's inanimate, uh, is simply contradicted by the information density uh, of uh, the, uh, the world uh, around us. Um, and uh, one of the things, if you like, that character characterizes uh, a lot, a uh, great deal of, of, of matter is that it is structured in such a way that invites uh, recognition, where it can be decoded in, in particular ways uh, and made sense of by the uh, receiving uh, entity. Um, what I would like to suggest is that um, when we um, think about this, um, that basically what we're thinking about um, is what I call this, the tradosphere. Um, and the tradosphere is basically the sum of all the signifying uh, systems uh, in our, our, our world. Uh, so when we're talking about the notion of relatedness, how we might relate to the non-human and so on, it seems to be one of the things that we're going to do or to think about um, is uh, how we uh, engage uh, with this multiplicity uh, of uh, signifying uh, systems. Now, some work has already begun in the area of uh, eco-semiotics. Uh, um, a more uh, recent example was in a chapter in the volume that was edited by two translation scholars, Hugh von Dessler and uh, Yves uh, Gombier, um, in an article by uh, Corbus uh, Marais and Kaledi Kuhl, uh, on uh, biosemiotics uh, and uh, translation studies, challenging the translation, where basically they're investigating or looking at the notion of what signifying systems might mean in the material uh, world and how we might uh, think about this in terms of, of translation. And how I don't use the term tradosphere, but how we might integrate this into the notion of the uh, tradosphere. The Second um, element or line of inquiry in what I'm calling uh, terracentric uh, translation studies um, is the notion of interspecies uh, communication. Um, one of the points that was made by Elizabeth Colbert in 2012 book uh, Sixth uh, Extinction is that if we continue uh, with what we're doing at present, um, that 50% uh, or more of all uh, flora and fauna on the planet uh, will have been destroyed by the end of this uh, century. Um, that is a fairly modest estimate because the rate of acceleration of species destruction keeps, uh, keeps increasing. Um, so just at a moment where we have to think about our relatedness uh, to other species, uh, we're destroying these species at an unprecedented uh, rate. Um, then, if we look at um, the food that's on our plate, um, we have to think about uh, the kinds of conditions um, in which um, a great many 
uh, animals are, are kept, one of the points that uh, the Israeli historian Yuval uh, Noah Harari makes in his uh, second last book, um, Sapiens, is uh, the consequences for domesticated uh, animals uh, of uh, food uh, production uh, through the uh, millennia. If up to 90% of food production, for example, in the United States, is industrialized uh, agriculture, um, then you know, what uh, are the consequences for these uh, species? Uh, remember that uh, there are approximately 26 billion uh, chickens uh, on the, uh, the planet as, uh, as I speak. Um, and there are, so there are billions of uh, domesticated uh, animals. What kinds of conditions are, are these animals uh, living in? Um, and of course, this then um, begs the question about how we think uh, about the notion of the, the, the animal. Um, one of the points that's made by the Italian philosopher, uh, Giorgio Abramelli, is um, that down through the centuries, the notion of making a distinction between the human and the animal has been absolutely central to various forms of social exclusion. Yeah? Um, that the surest way uh, to exclude someone uh, from the community of the human uh, is to deride uh, or treat them as uh, animals. Um, and we find this in the kind of language that was used in anti-Semitism, uh, the notion of the Jew as a rat, uh, what we see in the Rwandan uh, genocide, the use of the notion of kafar, of cockroach, uh, as a way of legitimizing uh, genocidal uh, practices. Uh, and again and again and again, whether it's slaves, uh, wild men, uh, barbarians, uh, the colonized, uh, and so on, plenty of examples here in, in Australia and Tasmania, of how the kind of the animalization uh, of the other was a, a crucial way of subjecting people to all kinds of exclusion, uh, abuse, and, and worse. Um, in this context, um, Primo Levi, um, in an essay, uh, in uh, which he published in, in Italian, it was, it was recently published in English translation, his book Interpreting Nazi Concentration Camps, um, talks about um, how you know, one of the ways of singling out uh, someone as, as, as barbarian, um, as uh, animal-like, was they didn't speak our language, or their language was gibberish, their language was incomprehensible, uh, their language uh, was really the, the grunts uh, squeals of animals, uh, not properly human speech. If it was a properly human speech, uh, then these people were subhuman, uh, inhuman, and, uh, and so on. Um, one of the um, arguments uh, that's made by people like uh, Loretta Valdeon, who's written recently uh, about uh, Spanish translation practice in the Americas, is um, that one of the things that translation did um, it wasn't always a force for good, um, but it could be a force for good. And one of the ways in which it was a force for good um, was the translation of people's languages into a language that was intelligible uh, to the, uh, the imperial uh, master. By making the language intelligible to the imperial master, uh, you made them aware of the historical and cultural uh, and social complexity of their cultures, uh, which had previously uh, been uh, obscured. One of the reasons why there's this great movement in 18th century Ireland uh, to translate texts from Irish Gaelic into English was to show um, that the Gaelic-speaking natives uh, were not savage, were not barbarian, were not inhuman, were not subhuman, because they spoke uh, this language that was utterly incomprehensible, a kind of wild uh, gibberish, um, but was uh, a language that had its own history, complexity, uh, culture, and, and so on. So this kind of move, if you like, um, to uh, restore a sense of internal complexity uh, through uh, translation is arguably the kind of uh, impulse that informs uh, certain practices uh, in uh, interspecies, or the move towards thinking about uh, translation and interspecies communication. Um, an example uh, of uh, this would be the work of uh, Tom uh, um who uh, uh, published this work, Chasing uh, Dr. Uh, Doolittle, um, Learning the Language of uh, Animals, where basically uh, what he did 
in this work um, was he um, took uh, these recordings that he did of the calls of, of prairie uh, dogs and he looked at the situations in which these calls were being uh, produced uh, and, and, and so on. Um, he gradually, uh, with the, the help of people working in the area of linguistic uh, anthropology and working in animal studies, uh, began to work out a kind of a structure uh, for the, uh, the communication. Um, and then with, uh, with the help of uh, an artificial intelligence specialist, we began to develop uh, devices or, or machines uh, that would allow for a certain degree of communication between uh, humans and these uh, and these dogs. Um, now, what's interesting is uh, about this particular uh, project is um, two things. One is he said that a great deal of communication, uh, he said, uh, was a form of kind of gossip, a social grooming, and was actually incomprehensible. Um, something could penetrate uh, at all. Um, if it like sort of in-house gossip in, in academic departments, which is impenetrable to everybody uh, except the people directly uh, involved. But the second thing was the impulse behind it. Um, he argued that one of the reasons that he wanted to engage in this form of research um, was to make people uh, aware uh, of the internalized complexity of animal worlds as a way of resisting uh, practices of subordination, uh, subjection, um, humiliation and, uh, and, and worse. Um, there is, of course, a danger in this, and the danger is anthropomorphism. Um, uh, just as one of the, the great uh, difficult debates in, in translation is to what extent we can uh, adapt, adopt uh, texts uh, and languages to uh, target cultures and, and languages. Uh, well, there's a similar problem in interspecies translation or communication. Uh, and this is born out of this uh, uh, film that Werner Herzog um, directed, came out in 2005. And it's a film about this one here, Timothy uh, Treadwell. Uh, Timothy Treadwell founded a group called Grizzly People. Uh, he went uh, every summer for 15, 16 summers to Alaska, uh, to one of the, the sort of national parks there. Uh, he befriended, in inverted commas, um, the uh, grizzly uh, bears there, uh, and was, he, he uh, filmed himself you know, with the bears, you know, kind of you know, putting his his arm like, partially uh, around one of these uh, grizzly bears. You see him here uh, with one of the. Uh, he went around school uh, trips and tours. He showed films on himself uh, with these uh, animals. Uh, and then, in October the 15th, 2003, the Grizzlies turned him, uh, and he was mauled to death with his uh, Danish girlfriend in their tent uh, in the National Park in Alaska. Now, what Werner Herzog does is there are a number of um, interviews uh, with park rangers and park wardens, uh, and they said that they were extremely... What he did was he crossed a line. He, what he refused to recognize what the, was that these animals were different, that there was a kind of ontological difference about these uh, animals, uh, and he failed to respect, if you like, uh, the, this kind of ontological integrity of these uh, other uh, species. Um, and this is um, similarly the point that's made by Temple Grandin in her book, uh, Animals in, in Translation, um, where She's, um, she's primarily interested in how uh, human-animal relationships can be used to, uh, to deal with, in a kind of therapeutic sense, uh, problems uh, around uh, autism. Um, but one of the incidental points that she makes in the book, which is important for our purposes, is that she talks about the need to communicate across difference. Right? In other words, that engaging in interspecies communication, engaging in a notion of translation to restore a uh, kind of internalized complexity to rethink our relationship with, with animals, also crucially involves acknowledging difference. And it seems to me that one of the things that we, we ought to do uh, as, as translators, one of the things we think about, is thinking about uh, or respecting or paying attention to uh, cultural, uh, linguistic, sociological, psychological, uh, differences and so on that are embedded in particular languages, uh, cultures, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, 
Because one of the things that translators, uh, it seems to me, have had to grapple with down through the centuries are two things. One is communication across difference, and the secondly is what Maria Tomaszko calls the underdetermination of meaning. Now, how do you deal with texts produced by cultures that no longer exist, by, in languages that are no longer spoken, with sets of cultural assumptions and values uh, that we may or may not uh, understand. So as translators, as translation scholars, uh, we have a long history in trying to deal or grapple with these problems. So if we were to think about a notion of interspecies communication uh, as part of this kind of terracentric translation studies, it seems to me we could do uh, no worse than to try, uh, or we should certainly should try and draw on those particular uh, aspects uh, to our, our work and uh, history. Um, the third uh, element to this terracentric uh, TS is what I'm going to call the uh, resource unconscious. Now, let me begin with this book here um, by uh, Ethan Zuckerman. Uh, who is the director of the MIT Media uh, Lab. Um, and it's uh, Rewire uh, Digital Cosmopolitans in the Age of Connection. So what he does is he sets up an opposition between what he calls cyber-utopianism and digital cosmopolitanism. So cyber-utopianism is the idea um, that uh, we have the internet, it's wonderful, you know, I turn it on, uh, I've got uh, the, the uh, potential uh, to be in contact with all these different languages, uh, cultures, uh, identities, uh, experiences, accounts, stories, and so on. And so just as with the birth of the telegraph, just as with the birth of cinema, just as with the birth of radio, just as with the birth of television, there's a sense in which you have this kind of utopia of communication possibilities that are opened up uh, by this uh, new medium. But then he says, um, let's look not at what the internet is supposed to do, but let's look at what people actually do with it. So uh, I said, what you find is that people overwhelmingly, uh, and this you know, whole battery of statistics uh, they produce to show this, they overwhelmingly look at material in their own language, from their own culture, uh, from their indigenous uh, news sources, and so on. Even when you look at people's Facebook friends, um, that when you look at the average, it's 14 uh, extraterritorial friends out of every hundred, uh, but those figures are completely skewed by the fact that you would have an Indian student who goes to New York, uh, who may have 90% uh, and uh, more of his friends extraterritorial, but then when you kind of average these out, you get this sort of figure. The real figure uh, is people's uh, extraterritorial uh, Facebook friends, with the exception of most of the people here in this room, because we've all worked across different languages, nations, and cultures, and so on, is actually very, very small. So what he calls homophily, that people tend to converge uh, on uh, the same kind of language, culture, and identity, is the dominant feature of the internet, rather than uh, activity. So he says, how do we fight this homophily? How do we fight kind of cyber utopianism? How do you create what he calls digital cosmopolitanism, where you actually get real connectivity as opposed to a utopian fiction of connectivity? Well, he says that one of the ways that we can do this is through translation. Um, is we can use translators as kind of digital mediators who will bring us the news uh, from elsewhere. They will bring the news from elsewhere into uh, our own language. They will act as these kinds of, uh, kind of polyglot cultural uh, brokers that will, that will genuinely uh, open up uh, the, uh, the internet. So, of course, for people like ourselves who work in uh, translation, this is great news. This is exactly the kind of thing we want to hear. This is why we want to champion uh, somebody like uh, Ethan Zuckerman. But what I would like to argue from a sort of terracentric point of view is this could be quite problematic. Um, and in this context, I want to briefly refer to a uh, young Belgian philosopher, uh, a man called uh, Pascal Chabot. Uh, this book hasn't been uh, translated uh, yet, um, but uh, his uh, L'Age des Transitions. Um, so what Chabot argues in, in L'Age des Transitions is that we need to develop what he calls uh, the science of transitology. Uh, what he means by transitology um, is we need to develop some body of thought or uh, science that will allow us to move from where we are to a post-carbon uh, society. And in order to do that then, we need to think about what he calls la boîte noire. We've got to think about the black box, what I would call the resource unconscious, which is basically 
that the thing that drives so much of what we do is the thing we talk about least. And so in other words, the, if you look at what was the major energy source in antiquity, it was slavery. Human labor was the main energy source. We tend to think of our as school and so on, but the main uh, energy source uh, in the Greek classical world uh, was uh, slavery. But slaves don't get much mention in uh, a great deal of uh, Greek uh, classical literature. Um, if we think of the 19th century and 20th century, um, how many novels, poems will talk about fossil fuels? Um, okay, Zola. Uh, we can think of some of the late uh, romantics. Um, but really, we're going to come up with just a handful. In other words, what happens uh, with the sort of the, the energy sources, the, the means to, to various human ends, is they become they, they disappear into this black box. They become uh, hidden uh, from uh, view. And one can argue that translation as a kind of means to end becomes, if you like, uh, hidden in that black box too. This is why it often remains uh, in, invisible. Um, and this, of course, is the problem with the kind of uh, digital cosmopolitan utopia that Zuckerman is presenting us, is um, that one of the things that he is obscuring, he's talking about translations mediation, but he's not talking about energy as, as mediation. Um, so when we go to work as translators, um, if we, you know, the, the, the computers that are here uh, on uh, our desk in front of us, um, they contain a very high proportion of rare, precious, uh, and dangerous uh, metals. Um, when we go to take out our mobile phones, and we go from to 3G, 4G, or future 5G uh, connectivity, uh, our energy consumption increases 15 times compared to uh, an Ethernet connection for 3G, uh, it's 43 times for 4G, and 76 times uh, for uh, 5G. Um, 60% or more of uh, our IT materials get recycled in countries with extremely low, poor, or non-existent uh, ecological standards. So children are dying, their parents are being poisoned uh, as a result of these uh, recycling uh, activities. Um, the messages that keep piling up on your uh, unread uh, box in the Google uh, Mail, your Gmail account, uh, comes at a cost. Uh, the cost is data centers. Um, in 2010, these uh, data centers um, already were consuming more than the totality of the energy produced by uh, renewables uh, on the planet. In uh, 2010, uh, we had about one zettabyte uh, of, um, of data in these centers. That's about uh, one trillion standard uh, USB keys. Um, in 2013, this risen to three uh, zettabytes. So, uh, the thing is uh, as that one of the unspoken aspects uh, of the kind of the digital cosmopolitan utopia is the black box, is the kind of resource un unconscious, the fact that there's nothing virtual about the impact of the, uh, the virtual. Um, so when we as translators then uh, engage ourselves, um, I think that engagement is inescapable. Uh, with the uh, with the technical, with the technical, because this has always been with us from the invention of writing uh, through the printing press, uh, the typewriter, and and so on. Uh, one of the things that we need to think about uh, is this uh, resource unconscious, and we can think about this in two ways. Uh, one is in terms of what we would call supply side ecology, uh, and the other is in terms of the demand side uh, ecology. Let me begin with the supply side ecology. One of the ways we can deal with this question of um, the resource unconscious is we can try and be more efficient, more careful, uh, uh, more sort of ecologically friendly in terms of the technologies we use. So we can use low-tech internet networks that you'll find in parts of rural Catalonia or Kerala state in India where we use uh, a cheap recyclable uh, materials with, with low energy consumption uh, to perform the role of an internet network. You can use a data mule uh, system or use a public transport uh, system to sort of carry the information around from uh, village uh, to village. We can use a modular production process so that we can uh, recycle, repair easily the kind of computers that we have. We can introduce uh, ecological, uh, much higher environmental standards for recycling uh, of uh, goods and so on. We can use uh, new computing paradigms, such as neuromorphics, uh, where we try to uh, look 
at uh, the functioning of the brain. Our, our brain is an extraordinarily energy efficient uh, system. With its 100 billion neurons, it's powered by the equivalent of a 20 watt light bulb. Um, so the thing is, could we reproduce that in terms of our, um, our, our computational uh, models uh, in order to uh, conserve, uh, reduce uh, energy, uh, and so on? So this is what we might call supply side uh, ecology. Um, this is the more problematic one, is demand side ecology. Um, if we look at what is the single most prevalent paradigm in terms of use of translation in the contemporary uh, world, it's the localization industry. Um, what does the localization industry argue? Uh, the reason you should invest in translation is you will sell more goods and services. But the more money you put into uh, translation, uh, the better and more effective and efficient your translations are, the more goods and services you are going to sell. The difficulty, of course, with that is that it's feeding uh, an ideology of infinite economic growth. And it's an ideology of infinite economic growth that's proven to be extremely problematic for the planet in terms of its carrying capacity. It is to what extent can the planet be like sustain uh, that kind of uh, model of indefinite uh, growth? So is there a sense then in which a kind of terra-centric translation studies would have to rethink uh, the impact of, of localization, would have to rethink uh, or maybe strategize the use of scarce translation resources um, to, if you like, uh, favor or support um, those uh, activities um, which are going to reduce uh, rather than expand our ecological or carbon uh, footprint. Um, the final, um, if you like, line of inquiry that I want to look at this evening um, is in the uh, area of um, what we might call uh, geo, uh, what has been called uh, geo criticism. In Bertrand uh, Westphal's the translation of his book in uh, 2009. Um, basically, what happens from the late uh, 1980s uh, onwards is there's a kind of a shift uh, in many areas of thought from a kind of preoccupation with time, with the temple, that was very much the kind of the, the legacy of the Hegelian and Marxist tradition, also the sense of the French Revolution, these events happening in time, uh, modernity as a kind of disruptive event uh, in, in time, and move from that uh, to think about uh, space, to think about space-based uh, aesthetics, to think about uh, the notion of space uh, rather than, than time, and how space then is, is dwelt in, uh, and with that you get the emergence of, of place. So beginning to interpret, to think about uh, place in, in, in various ways became uh, an important, an increasingly important uh, concern of people in different disciplines. This is why geography uh, for example, began to take on a particular uh, importance uh, from the early 2000s. It had all been important discipline, but it, it kind of became very prominent uh, with the work of Dorian Massey and, and others as a result of that preoccupation uh, with space. You see this in translation studies, in the work of somebody like Sherry Simon, Her Cities in Translation. Um, Sherry and I also at specialists in translation studies in city as translation zone. So looking at how translation, if you like, operated in or informed or organized uh, spaces uh, in uh, different uh, cities. Um, one of the ways in which we can think about this from a translation point of view um, is uh, suggested by uh, the uh, British uh, writer, um, travel writer, nature writer, uh, and poet, uh, Robert McFarlane. Um, in this book, uh, Landmarks, um, he travels uh, around uh, Britain uh, and he, in, the, in the kind of the paths of, of various uh, nature writers and, and travel writers. Um, and basically, his, his object, he says, is to resist the temptation to turn landscape into blandscape. Um, so, in other words, that kind of generic description of the hill, the wood, uh, the park, right? um, to see how can language, when you pay more attention to it, um, has the resources um, to 
properly uh, describe or interpret uh, or inform one about uh, the landscape, and the people who've dwelt in it, the stories that are embedded uh, in that landscape, uh, and so on. So he has these, what he calls, counter-desecration uh, glossaries. So you've got wetlands, flatlands, uplands, marshlands, and, and so on. And how, um, what he, he argues is that there is um, a, a road that goes from the aesthetic to the ethical. And that once you begin to uh, engage with, to properly describe uh, the, 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 the landscape is uh, you then begin to uh, engage with it or care for it in, in a particular way. So, in other words, um, you can only care for uh, a landscape uh, that you can, at some level, uh, properly uh, understand. And of course, what happens then as it goes through, uh, through Britain is, um, so sort of the, the island of Britain, is he begins to, uh, what emerges is all these sort of uh, buried uh, languages, Old Norse, Scots Gaelic, uh, Irish Gaelic, um, the various dialects uh, of uh, English in different parts uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the island. Um, so what he's bringing, if you like, is the kind of, almost the kind of the translation residue of uh, the different cultures uh, that have passed through that uh, particular uh, place. And so what he's, he's suggesting at one level is that English as a major language is minoritized by the cult of the landscape, uh, by the narrowing uh, of its frame of reference, by this kind of lexical uh, in, in, in impoverishment. Um, but also, that so this is kind of the mi minoritization in a negative sense, but in the positive sense is to bring to the fore, uh, to kind of translate into the major language, uh, all these uh, embedded uh, languages and traces of passage uh, and so on in the, the language itself. Why I think this has uh, a very um, immediate political resonance is um, the contention that Naomi Klein makes in This Changes uh, Everything is that where extractivist industries tend to be most toxic, where they tend to be most potent, where they tend to be most profitable, is in what she calls the sacrifice zones around the world. And she says, what characterizes the sacrifice zones? She says, the sacrifice zones are places that are generally inhabited by people who uh, are marginalized by reason of race, uh, by reason of social class, by reason of economic power or lack of it, and by language. Um, that in sacrifice zone after sacrifice zone after sacrifice zone, uh, you find, uh, more often than not, um, people speaking uh, minoritized or indigenous languages <coughs> of uh, various uh, kinds. Um, one of these um, uh, peoples uh, in uh, Mexico, in Norwegian, in the Seri uh, people, uh, who uh, came under severe uh, pressure uh, from uh, an oil uh, exploration uh, company. Um, and of course, one of the things about the, 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 the Seri uh, language is uh, its multiplicity of uh, names for uh, desert plants. Often the names themselves give you clues to the nutritional properties. The names that they use to describe uh, various uh, animals such as uh, sea turtles um, often uh, give one uh, an idea as to the behavior of these animals, which are only laterally kind of discovered by uh, by scientists. Um, but one of the um, points that's not made by, by Klein, but I think uh, needs to be made, is that one of the things that is essential both to the, um, the development of uh, indigenous languages in sacrifice zones uh, and in, in making the, the complexity of these languages and cultures uh, and peoples apparent is through translation. It's through uh, the act of translation um, that is possible, if you like, to make people aware of just how much is lost, how much is endangered, how much knowledge is, is sacrificed um, as a result of a of kind of blind, unyielding uh, extractivism. Um, and this brings me to uh, my final slide, we have to go, uh, is um, the work of the Brazilian uh, anthropologist uh, Eduardo uh, Veros uh, Castro. Um, in his Cannibal Metaphysics, um, he argues um, that in 
the cultures and languages of indigenous peoples in various parts of the planet, the, the very people who find themselves in these sacrifice zones. And you find uh, a philosophy, a culture, a way of engaging um, with other species and with the non-human uh, world that is part of what he would call a future-oriented cosmology. Right? In other words, that what we find in these cultures is not kind of the evidence of kind of salvaged archaeology, a kind of let's retrieve this culture before it disappears, a kind of memorializing or antiquarian gesture. Uh, what we uh, need to do, uh, De Castro argues, is to, and this point is taken by Bruno Latour as well in his uh, recent work, Fast Life Area, is we need to think about this in terms of uh, practices, uh, dispositions, ways of thinking, cultural knowledge that will allow us to create or to formulate a sustainable future. Uh, but I suppose uh, I would argue in conclusion um, that the only way in which we can do this is to think very, very deeply about the kinds of translation practice we're going to use, how we're going to go about uh, that translation, uh, and how we might strategize then uh, the use of our resources, our skills as translators and people who think about uh, translation. As I was saying uh, recently at a talk in, in Wellington, New Zealand, on cultural sustainability, there's only so much talking that an, an audience can sustain, and I think I've reached the end of my sustainable <laughs> uh, lot of time here, uh, so I, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>